I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Our episode today is Neurological Rehab, Functional Neurology. So functional neurology or chiropractic neurology is a field that's been around for several decades and probably a hundred years with the advent of chiropractic. Um, the idea of, of regular orthodox neurology is different than the idea of functional neurology, although it's not completely different. Um, originally, medical neurology was based on diagnosing and treating neurological disease. So you have to find it and you have to fix it. And unfortunately, much of that is medication and surgery based. Um, what we do is we do rehab exercises designed to make use of something called plasticity to help the brain get better and recover if it can. So we don't throw away the, the, the investigation of pathology. We certainly engage in that and we look for pathology and if the pathology exists, we work with it. We don't ignore it or, or push it aside. We definitely accept it and work with it. But um, we also use methods of what are called evoked potentials. Anytime that you touch yourself you have an evoked potential. A sensory signal goes up your arm to your brain and, and to the opposite side where you perceive it, and you can, you can feel that, that touch if everything's working properly. So any time you do something with your brain or your body, you're evoking potentials that fire around in your body and your brain. And if you evoke those potentials to neurons, nerve cells that are in your brain that need help or, or your spinal cord that need help, that need rehabilitation, that are weak, they begin to grow stronger and that's called plasticity. But the key is these cells are very much like Goldilocks. They don't like too much stimulation and they don't like too little stimulation. And they don't like, a lot of times, bilateral stimulation. They like unilateral stimulation, like very specific. They're very picky little neurons. They're very needy and they're very picky. Um, they, they need to be given the right stimulation or the right activation. And sometimes they need to be given inhibitory signals from their neighbors that tell them to be quiet and shush and not to fire. But any signal that goes to a nerve cell will tell it not just whether to do something or not do something, which is to say stimulate or inhibit, but also every one of those signals will make that cell also on the side take care of itself. It'll, it'll stimulate all the, all the machines inside the cell, all the organelles that will make that cell start to repair itself. It'll repair its walls, it'll repair its, its, um, its internal, internal little organelles, which are little organs. It'll repair uh, its membranes. It'll start to make um, and clear out debris that it's been storing because cell, cells will store debris like garbage. It's just like a, a college dorm where the kids save up their garbage and don't take it out because they're lazy. So um, over time, you've got to get that garbage out of your cells. And so stimulating and activating cells at the right frequency, the right stimulus is, is the real key to functional neurology. Now, we share functional neurology with, um, uh, we chiropractic neurologists share functional neurology with psychologists. Psychologists have really brought functional neurology to the fore as well because they started, started studying using functional image machines. Now, the decade of the brain was 1990 to 2000, and that was funded by the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, where um, the government, the US government, started giving money to universities and saying, we really want you to study the brain and understand how it functions, not just whether it's, uh, there's a chunk missing or there's been a bleed or there's been a stroke or there's been a, you know, something uh, damaging like a bullet or, or something. Those are obvious. We're talking about the more everyday lesions of the brain that are called functional lesions, not ablative or destructive or you know, um, pathological lesions that you could find a pathology if you dissected the brain. We're talking about electrical disturbances, functional disturbances, disturbances that don't indicate pathology, but they indicate a misfiring that is not desirable and not balanced. So that decade of the brain brought about functional MRI scanning and PET scanning, positron emission tomography scanning. It brought about um, uh, magnetoencephalography, which is magnetic waves of the brain. It brought about QEEG, which I talk about in other lectures here and I perform in my office. Uh, it talked about SPECT scans, which is a, um, um, a CT scan, a, an x-ray of the brain that, that measures brain function. So all of these methods looked at either uh, blood flow or glucose metabolism or some kind of metabolism in the brain or, or how, how water molecules moved when you shine radiation or um, radio waves through them, which is um, how an MRI works. And so as you, as you do these waves um, 
as you do these different imaging uh, methods of brains, you, you find different ways to, to measure what the brain's doing. And as you, as you look at how the brain functions, you can begin to compare healthy people to unhealthy people and see what is uh, really ideal function and what is not so ideal. So when we do um, functional neurology, we, we use those imaging systems, but we also do the most important thing, which is a classical, complete neurological examination. And sometimes we do a focal neurological examination. So um, a neurological examination classically is a very detailed system, systematic review of a person's neuraxis or their brain and spinal cord and nervous system where the doctor is examining the sensory system, what you feel, all of the motor system, what, how you move, the uh, extrapyramidal system or the cerebellar and, and brain and um, basal ganglia system, which is your balance and coordination that's unconscious. Uh, it'll, it'll measure uh, spontaneous movements, like when people get tr tremors and, and ticks and movements that are spontaneous. You may see that in a person with dystonia or a person with Parkinsonism or a person with any number of, of movement disorders. Um, we measure um, the uh, autonomic nervous system, which is to say sweating temperature regulation, digestion, and secretion of, of the organs. We measure everything that we can, and, and some exams are more detailed than others, but in general, we're trying to get a picture of where in the brain is the dysfunction and where is the target for our therapy. Where is the brain area that we're going to work on? And we call that, unfortunately, the longitudinal level of the lesion, or the LLL. The longitudinal level of the lesion is borrowed from classical neurology where they're looking for pathology. So if you had a, a stroke in your brain and I was examining you, I'd be looking for the stroke. Where did it happen? And I would examine you and I would try to triangulate, oh, it happened here, or it happened over here, or it happened back here. And so that examination is what a trained neurologist does, whether they're an orthodox medical neurologist or whether they're a chiropractic neurologist. And so these, these functional neurology exams are designed to measure subtleties and measure fatigability and measure not necessarily disease, although we do diagnose disease and we catch disease, but we're looking for imbalances that we can correct with subtle brain exercises that are carefully tuned to the individual. So the assessment process is a neurological exam and history taking and observation where we watch a person walk, we ask them to move, we ask them to do a bunch of tasks for us, we examine their eyes, we examine their cranial nerves, we examine their, um, their tongue and their mouth, we look at any asymmetries of their face and arms and legs, we look for atrophy, we just do a classical neurological exam and we add that subtle bit of fatigability to see if there are subtle asymmetries from side to side or fatigues where they do a task and then they tire out, like they might look back and forth from object to object and then they slow down with those eye movements called saccades. Or we might watch them do pursuits and they do pursuits that are not pathological, but their pursuits become jagged and broken down. And so they don't have smooth pursuit mechanisms, which they're supposed to have ideally. So by, by um, knowing what is ideal and normal and healthy, we can then figure out where a person's brain problems are and we can ascribe or prescribe specific brain exercises for them to make that area start to grow stronger and get better using what's called plasticity. Because when you do stimulate those parts of the brain that we localize with these exams, we know through the concept of plasticity, which has been well established, that if you get the, if you get the stimulus right, it's not too much and not too little, those cells will begin to heal and start to, to get better. And that even happens sometimes in brain pathologies. Sometimes it can also forestall um, the progression of disease in some cases. We don't fully know how, how that works and we can't make disease claims right now, but we can say that some patients do better when they do functional exercises, regardless of whether they're, they're pretty much healthy and they're going for high achievement and, and peak performance, or whether they have a known disease that's been well diagnosed and agreed upon and, and they do functional exercises for their brain and that may forestall the um, progression of their disease and give them more happier years of more production and better, um, better quality of life. So uh, you'll get, you'll get um, specific exercises for you. And the really cool thing about these neuro exercises is that unlike physical therapy, which I love, um, the, the uh, neurological exercises are not designed to fix a joint or a soft tissue. They're designed to fix brains and spinal cords. So usually there's dynamic change every single visit. Um, if, if things are working correctly, there should be change every visit and you should progress from one exercise to another, to another, to another. And, um, and if you're not, that tells us that there's something wrong that we're missing. That could be nutritional. That could be toxic. 
You could be exposed to mold and we don't know about it or carbon monoxide. You could be um, overdoing your exercises. You could be secretly eating junk food that I don't know about and it's messing with your brain chemistry and excito causing excitotoxins from um, MSG, for example, or, or just too much too much simple sugars are just blasting your insulin system and, and changing how your brain works and changing how uh, your brain chemistry works, which is for another topic. Uh, so that, that concept of, of using brain exercises and the progression of brain healing to gauge whether a person is, um, is uh, exposed to toxins or, or eating right or, or getting enough sleep you know, will show us because we'll be, for example, we'll be working with a patient and we'll be giving them some brain exercises, visit to visit to visit. And each visit they get, they improve, they improve, they improve, and then they plateau. They might plateau because, you know, the doctor missed something. That happens with me all, all the time. And I, I, I learn and I struggle and I figure out what's going on and I change the exercises and we make a breakthrough. Or sometimes the patient discovers they're not sleeping. They've had a terrible menstrual period and they're not sleeping for a week and they hit a plateau because of that. So then that steers us toward correcting the menstrual imbalance. And so we dive into that. So um, one type of modality helps us discern other types of processes that are going wrong in a person that we can correct and bring back to balance. And I like that an awful lot.